How many of you believe in the power and the presence of peace? How many of us, if we're honest with ourselves, could use more peace? <laughs> I love you're warming up to my Pentecostal roots. I'm hearing <laughs> amens. A amens. <laughs> How many of us know that we could practice more peace? And another question. How many of us believe in the power and the presence of courage? And if we are honest with ourselves, how many of us could use more courage? <laughs> and how many of us know that we could practice life in a more courageous way? Yeah. It's not very often we hear those two words together, peace and courage. But today we're going to talk about why you really can't talk about one without the other. Because in order to have peace, you must have courage. And if you have inner courage, you will have peace. The two really do work together as one. Today is the first Sunday in February, and we are kicking off a four-week series that is based on the season of nonviolence. How many of you are familiar with that 64-day season of nonviolence? Good, there's only a, a few people, so we have the opportunity to introduce a number of people to this. In 1998, a grassroots campaign dedicated to demonstrating that nonviolence is a powerful way to heal transform and empower our lives and our communities. If you look at the front of the bulletin, you see the official symbol for the season of nonviolence. And then you see the picture of two men. Do, who's the one on the left? Gandhi. Gandhi. Who's the one on the right? Martin Luther King Jr. This 64-day campaign was started by Gandhi's grandson, Arun Gandhi, as a yearly event to celebrate nonviolence and how to cultivate and practice nonviolence. And so it begins on January 30th. It started this past Friday. It's the 17th season this year. January 30th is the anniversary of the assassination of Gandhi. It runs for 64 days to April 4th, which is the anniversary of the assassination of Dr. King. And so during that time, and in honor of those two individuals and many other, other individuals around the world, and so far there are many countries that are participating in this practice, you can actually go on a website if you just Google Season for Nonviolence, you find there are 64 ways in 64 days to bring about nonviolence. There are seven principles that are a part of this foundation, and I want to go through this, uh, if you give me that first slide. Alan, the first joint principle of nonviolence says every individual can move the world in the direction of peace with their nonviolent choices and actions. Second one, nonviolence means honoring the dignity and inherent worth of every human being. The next. Nonviolence means believing that our lives are linked together and what we do impacts the lives of others. Therefore, we are responsible for one another. Next, nonviolence means dedicating ourselves to guaranteeing the fundamental rights of humans everywhere in ways of justice, equity, and equality. It means using our talents to empower others as well as ourselves. The fifth one says, nonviolence is courageously choosing to practice compassion with our apparent, apparent, apparent adversaries. <laughs> we impose injustice and not people. Take a deep breath after that one. Isn't that true? We impose injustice and not people. The sixth one. Nonviolence means recognizing love as the power of the human spirit to triumph over injustice, social inequity, suffering. This is what Joseph Campbell talked about as the hero's journey. And number seven, nonviolence means choosing nonviolence as a way of life by practicing daily peace. I love that word choice, that our life story is written by our choices and our actions. And so the season of nonviolence is a time where we bring our awareness to this, 
our capacity to show up in ways that are nonviolent and peaceful. And today we look at why courage is such an important and essential part of that. Dr. King said, peace is not merely a distant goal that we seek, but a means by which we arrive at that goal. That peace is the way to peace, and peace requires courage. And so today we're going to look at what is courage? Where does it come from? And how do we get it and put it into practice? So what is courage? I love the song that Tim sang because it, not only did he sing, he revealed his heart. And he talked about, listen to my heart. You know, when we say things, we say things like, I learned it by heart. We don't say things, we do say, I learned it by rote. But when we say, I've learned it by heart, we know that we've really learned at a level or she had a change of heart, he had a change of heart. We use those things because we know that when we refer to the heart, we're not just simply referring to this physical organ, but that we are referring to our capacity to be a part of this human experience, this human heart. The word courage, so what is courage? Courage is a heart word. The root of the word courage is core. It's the Latin word that means heart. And so in its earliest forms, courage meant one who would live with their whole heart. It is wholehearted living. I would say with a capital W. It's that living from an awareness of your whole self, your whole being. To put your whole heart in requires courage. The most courageous thing we can do is to tell the truth. Amen? The most courageous thing we can do is learn to recognize our own truth, to be responsible for our own truth. And so that's what courage actually, that's what courage is. There is, sometimes when we think about what courage is, it's also helpful to think about what courage is not. There's a story about a people who were out in the Mediterranean on a beautiful cruise ship. And it was a beautiful day. They were in the blue waters of the Mediterranean, having a party up on the top of the ship. And during the party, somehow or another, a woman fell off the side of a ship. And right after she went off, an older man went off after her. And he was, he was well up in age. And people were surprised that this man went in. But the young woman in the water grabbed a hold of the man and he was able to keep both of them up until they could get a little lifeboat down and get them both out. And so that night, they had a huge party. They were celebrating and honoring this man who had saved this girl's life, this woman's life. At this celebration, the woman got up and she thanked the man. Her husband got up. The children got up. The whole time, the man that was being honored, he sat there very uncomfortable. You could tell he was not liking what was going on. And, but it kept on. The captain got up. Different people got up and just threw the accolades at him. And then they finally said, sir, would you come up and just speak? And when he walked up, he said, I only have one thing to say. Who pushed me in? <laughs> <laughs> That's not courage. <laughs> so when we're asking ourselves, what is courage? <laughs> and That's not a demonstration of courage. He was seeking revenge. He, somebody pushed him in, apparently. Courage is, is not, it's also not being a bully. It's not intimidating someone. Would you give me this slide? Courage is not synonymous with being fearless. You can have courage and fear at the same time. In fact, you don't really need courage unless you are feeling fear. Having both courage and fear at the same time, when we ask ourselves, what is courage? It's the willingness to live with our whole heart. And it's also understanding that courage is not the absence of fear, but is the willingness to show up, to show our heart, to draw our strength from our higher self, to feel that connection with the heart of humanity and to keep moving forward. That's what courage is. It's to truly live with our whole heart. And so if we ask ourselves then, where does courage come from? 
There's a scripture in the Bible in 2 Timothy that says, God does not give us a spirit of fear, but of courage and compassion and wisdom. I've always loved that scripture because it reminds me of the Wizard of Oz. Do you remember in the Wizard of Oz they were seeking courage, compassion, and wisdom? And that it was all about finding those things not outside of us but within us. And so that even though when we show up and when we have fear, to realize it's okay. Fear is part of our human experience. Our fear keeps us safe. And yet our fear can actually cause us to do things that we wouldn't normally do unless we are willing and learn how to be present to our fear. You see, our fear is meant to inform us. It is not meant to kidnap us. It is not meant to suppress us. It is not meant to, to use us to act out in ways that are unloving, but it is meant for us to be present to our fear, to own it, to say when we're afraid. And then in those times, to be able to walk with that fear and to realize I can have this fear or I can have this doubt, and yet I also have a spirit of courage and compassion and wisdom. And I can walk forward to do whatever it is that is mine to do. Reverend Dr. Gary Simmons is a unity minister. He's also a book author. And he also, for a number of years, he taught karate. And he led a karate studio. He told a story of a little boy that his parents brought in, this little boy, and he was a second grader. And he was constantly in fights. The guy, little boy was small for his age. He was being bullied. He was being picked on. And the little boy was not holding back. He was fighting for all he was worth, but he was constantly being beat up. And so his parents talked about it, and they said, well, let's put him in a karate class. He's at least got to learn how to defend himself. So Reverend Gary Simmons had this little boy in his class. And very quickly, the little boy began to learn. And he earned his first belt and then another belt. And the parents noticed a remarkable change in that boy. He stopped fighting. He was no longer being beat up. He was coming home. He was happier. He wasn't afraid to go to school. And his parents said, you know, we've noticed a big difference in you. What is it? Are the children afraid of you now that you are, have learned karate? And he said, no, they still pick on me, but I don't need to fight anymore. You see, through that practice of karate, he had learned that the most important thing was not fighting. The most important thing was about learning who he was. What he had inside of him that would give him the courage to turn and walk away. He no longer had to prove anything because he knew who he was. He knew what he could do if he had to do it, but he chose to show up in a way that was even more courageous. And in that case, it was simply to walk away. And so where does courage come from? It comes from within. And it is within each and every one of us. There's a story that appeared in the Los Angeles Times a number of years ago about a man named Ray Blankenship. Ray was at home one morning going through his normal routine. He prepared breakfast. He was making his coffee. And he looked out of his, of his window. And his window overlooked this big ditch that ran through the town. And he happened to see these children playing at the end of the water. And he saw a little girl fall in. And instantaneously, he ran out of his house and started running beside because the water, it had been raining, it was full, and he knew that just down the road, it would drop off into um, this ravine. And so he couldn't, he ran beside her, she was not getting out, so he jumped in. And the newspaper article said that when they were within three feet of the main drop off, he had her and he called on to something and they got her out. And the Coast Guard awarded him an award, but what people didn't know until he went up to receive his award is that Ray Blankenship cannot swim. But it was courage. You see, courage when, how many of you have read an article about a, a grandmother whose child was under a car and the woman picked it up? There is more in us than we know. And the circumstances of life can call it out at times. Life in us will either, just as an orange is always releasing its essence, so are we always expressing and releasing our essence. Anybody feel squeezed by life lately? 
<laughs> and you hope the essence that comes out is courageous, but <laughs> and that it smells nice and looks nice and, and tastes nice. But sometimes when life squeezes us, what is coming out doesn't feel so nice because we, we feel defensive. But in places like this, because he was connected heart to heart, he did what many of us did. He risked his own life. He did something that was very courageous because he was guided by his heart, his whole heart. And yet every day it shows up in many different ways. It shows up in large ways and it shows up in small ways. The Arthur, uh, Arthur Robert Frost said, courage is the human virtue that counts the most. And then the 18th century English doctor, Dr. Samuel Adams said, courage is the greatest of all virtues. Because if you haven't courage, you may not have the opportunity to use any of the others. So it is with peace. Peace requires courage. And inner courage will always bring peace. Courage is a necessary aspect of our daily life. Consider this. It takes courage to be honest. It takes courage to believe in ourselves and to pursue our dreams. It takes courage to say yes and it takes courage to say no. It takes courage to face an addiction. It takes courage to say, I need help. It takes courage to heal a relationship. It takes courage to move through grief or rejection or hurt. It takes courage to forgive, to show compassion, and to let go of the past. It takes courage to grow, to change, to trust, to love, and to fulfill our divine potential. All of these things take courage and the willingness to continually cultivate that space of courage. And so how do we do that in our daily lives? How do we cultivate courage? Well, Dr. Brene Brown says it, and I believe a beautiful way. Dr. Brene Brown is a professor in Texas. He's now an author of several different books, including Daring Greatly and The Gifts of Imperfection. She's done a lot of study and research on shame and vulnerability and courage. And she said, courage is a huge theme in my life. It seems that either I'm praying for some, feeling grateful for having found a little bit, appreciating it in other people, or studying it. I don't think that makes me unique. Everyone wants to be brave. After spending the past 10 years interviewing people about the truths of their lives, their strengths and their struggles, I realize that courage is not something we have or don't have. It is something we practice. The courage is always something that we practice. In the Bible, Jesus is referred to as two animals. And really, it's not Jesus so much as it's what we in unity call the Christ. It's this divine spirit within us. The, in, in Hinduism, that may be called the Atman or the divine spark. But it's referred to by both the lion and the, the lion and the lamb. Can you see that they are two faces of courage? That the lion at times need to be willing to show up, to draw boundaries, to say, this is what I stand for, this is yes, and this is no but not in a way that is intimidating, not in a way that is bullying. I love in The Wizard of Oz when the lion comes out, the first thing he does is he starts dancing around and he's like, put up your dukes, put up your dukes, if you remember that line. Well, how many of us put on our boxer's gloves and we're dancing around in our fancy footwork when we get caught up in fear or we feel defensive? You see the, the lion courage that has been called forth because the lion begins to box and then he starts name calling. He starts putting them down. That's threatening. That's intimidating. But that's not courage. Finally, the, th the third thing he does is he starts crying. How many of us start crying when we finally tell the truth? <laughs> when we get to that place of of being vulnerable, not vulnerable in a weak sense, but vulnerable in a wholehearted sense. It's like, okay, this is the truth. When we get ready to speak our truth, quite often we will cry. It's very vulnerable to tell our truth, but we go from being defensive to intimidating to truth-telling. That's the lion. And the lamb, the courage of the lamb, 
The lamb is that that, when, that knows that there's a time to follow, that knows that there's a time to be quiet, that there is a time to listen, that there is such a thing called authentic surrender. Anyone in a 12-step program has realized the power of authentic surrender because it's not giving up, it's giving over. It is realizing that I've been given a spirit of courage and compassion and wisdom. And I, in my current circumstance, may not know how to show up courageously or compassionately or wise, but there is something within me that will guide me. And so we cultivate it by our willingness to practice. We cultivate it by the first thing every day we spend time in prayer and meditation. We meditate on the source of our being and that our heart is right now being beat by what we may say this universal heart and that our heart is part of the universal spirit. We meditate on it. The second thing we do is we learn to recognize it. We think back in our own lives. How many of you can recall a time in your life when you really demonstrated courage? Every hand will go up. Every one of you know that there's a time. Even if it was being honest with yourself, we all know what it is. So we learn to recognize that we've done it before, we can do it again. And we learn to recognize it in other people. That every day there are courageous acts going on. For some people, it's simply to get out of bed. For some people, it's to show up at work. Whatever it is, we learn to recognize it. And then we prayerfully practice. What is mine to do to show up courageously? Would you give me that song, Richard? The last quote I'd like to share comes from Marianne Rodmacher, who's an artist and a writer. And she says, courage does not always roar. Sometimes courage is the quiet voice at the end of the day saying, I will try again. The season for nonviolence is inspired by many great people, but today we're in this week, this past week, we've talked about the life of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and what he stood for when he talked about the beloved community. You see, the man had a heart of courage because he showed up like a lion and a lamb. He was willing to die for what he believed in, and what he believed in was the human potential, the beloved community. But what a lot of us don't know about Dr. King is when he graduated from Colgate Rochester Theological Seminary, he applied for a job, a little Baptist church in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And when he applied for that church in Chattanooga, Tennessee, they looked at his resume and they said, he's well studied, but he is not experienced. He's right out of college. And so they sent Dr. King a rejection letter. <laughs> Can you imagine? How many of you have ever received a rejection? Been sidetracked? Had somebody poo-poo your dream? Had somebody tell you, you can't do that? What would have happened if he took that rejection letter and said, oh well, I must not be cut out for this. But you see, he had a heart of courage. When he was rejected, he allowed himself to be redirected and so he applied for another church in Montgomery Alabama and the rest is history because he was guided to work with a community that already had ideas about a beloved community you see sometimes when life is rejecting us or we feel like that things are happening we can either go into fear and fight or place a victim and just like the ego would have us pretend be something we're not, the ego would also have you say, oh well, I'm going to walk away because there's conflict here. No. Wisdom and courage and compassion are knowing what's mine to do and when to show up. And so we are this beloved community called to be courageous and peaceful. And so to lead us into a time of meditation to really anchor this, I want you to join me in these words that you, you know what he's probably playing.